Well, good morning, everyone, again. And uh, if, I, if you missed the first part of the service, uh, let me just introduce myself again. My name is Tim Swan, uh, the CEO of Anglican Aid, and it's a joy to be with you this morning. Now, let us pray that God uh, is with us this morning as we come to look at his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have as your people to gather uh, around your word, gather in our homes. Uh, we thank you for the technology of uh, the internet. Um, Lord, uh, there have been some distractions this morning, but help us to put those aside that we might hear from you, uh, that we might hear from you your living word, that that word might bubble up in our hearts as living water and that you might bring joy and transformation for your name. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning uh, I got up, got up out of bed. I uh, went to the bathroom. I turned on the tap and out came fresh water, clean water that I was able to drink. I went and hopped in the shower, I turned on the hot water, and it was like, um, from the heavens, this hot water just fell on me, amazing. Uh, I, turned, I went and made myself a cup of coffee, I gave the dog some water. Water is just an amazing gift that we have from God, and sometimes I think we uh, just take it for granted. This morning I wanted to talk with you about what the Bible says about water. And what I want to do is run from Genesis right through to Revelation on this theme of water from God. We start in Genesis, we end up in Revelation, as we've just heard, where we see a stream of living water flowing from the throne of God. And I pray that this vision of water uh, might lead us all to praise God and to help provide for those who thirst. So if we go, think of Genesis 1, God speaks the world into existence and its entire ecosystem with human beings as the pinnacle. Uh, then we come to Genesis chapter 2, we zoom in on the Garden of Eden and there we read in uh, chapter 2 verse 10, it says that there was a river watering the garden which flowed from Eden. From there it separated into four headwaters. And we understand water equals life. A uh, life is, throwing out, is flowing out from this garden in Eden. Uh, but then we get to Genesis chapter 3. What happens? Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve question God's goodness to them. They listen to what the serpent says. And they understand, for the serpent says to them, if you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. And they eat, only to discover that they are naked. Then they turn on God, they turn on each other, and in consequence, God expels them from the garden and turns nature against them. Uh, thorns and thistles grow. Instead of beautiful fruit, God's judgment fell on our rebellion. And that is the sin-broken world that we live in today, isn't it? That's the sin-broken world we live in. The question is, is there a way back to Eden? Is there a way back to the streams watering the paradise of God? And in the Bible narrative, we next come to Exodus. And you remember in Exodus, Moses led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery. Through the Red Sea, the people came into the desert, into a wilderness, a thirsty, parched land where the people grumble for water. Uh, God speaks to Moses, Moses and uh, God says to Moses to speak to the rock. And what happens? God brings water, streams of water, out of the rock. God is still the one who is able to provide the water of life. Uh, we come to the prophets. If you think of uh, Jeremiah, um, uh, we have from the prophets speaking that physical water becomes a symbol for spiritual water. So Jeremiah says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken systems that can hold no water. So we have this beautiful metaphor that God uses for himself, a fountain of living water. Uh, expresses something in God's character here. His love bubbles up. His mercy overflows. His justice is like a river. He is a fountain of living waters. 
And he says through the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Whoever has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy milk and, and, and wine without money and without cost. Uh, thirst is satisfied by coming to God. And for those who thirst and drink from him, this fount of living water, they now overflow with the love of God. So God says through Isaiah in the passage we just read in chapter 58, you shall be like a well-watered garden. You shall be like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And it's not surprising that uh, as God's son, Jesus used this same um, language, didn't he? Back in John 7, which I think you looked at a couple of weeks ago for, uh, for, for Pentecost last week, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So we know that physical rivers are good. They provide for drinking and, and, and washing and for, for cattle and for crops and gardens and for life. And so we understand that spiritual water is good as well. And so we come and drink, as it were, from Jesus Christ. Once you've drunk from Jesus, once you've drunk from that living water flowing from your heart, what is it going to look like? Well, if you turn back to chapter 58 of Isaiah... Uh, it is going to look like pouring yourself out for the hungry, satisfying the desires of the afflicted. But in Isaiah 58, God was appalled that those who claimed to be his people were not doing this. They were, verse 3, they were seeking their own pleasure. They were not pouring themselves out for the hungry. It's similar language to that that Jesus used when he speaks of the coming day of judgment in Matthew chapter 25. You might like to flip over, open to that. Matthew chapter 25. Uh, this is the passage where, uh, speaking of the last judgment, um, Jesus talks about dividing the sheep from the goats, uh, those who are his people by grace, from those who are not his people, uh, those who have come to him, from those who haven't come to him, the sheep and the goats. And he says to his sheep, verse 34 of Matthew 25, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he talks about what characterizes his sheep. What characterizes these people? Verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Truly, I tell you, he says, whoever did whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So it's beautiful, isn't it? How do you give a drink to Jesus? Uh, the woman at the well, uh, the woman at the at, at the well in John four, had the privilege of giving a drink of water to Jesus. Uh, you have that privilege too by giving water to a brother or sister who is in thirst. You are giving it not just to them, you are giving it, Jesus says, to him. And he will remember that at the day of judgment. Amazing. So let me tell you now about a few brothers and sisters who are thirsty, but through Anglican Aid, you as a church are helping provide with a drink. Um, so many stories I could, I could tell, uh, but um, I might start with the story of Norm Gorry in Marsabit. Some, some of you may know Norm. He's a CMS missionary. Uh, he's working in northern Kenya, rural, uh, uh, very dry area. And uh, it, it's a place where um, the uh, Muslims are pushing down from the north, but Norm is seeing many... Muslim, um, Muslims become Christians, converted and become Christians. The difficulty is that when they become Christians, they are cut, cut out of their families and they lose their jobs, kicked out of their employment. They're persecuted as new followers of Christ. Now, they're left destitute. How can the church help these people? 
Well, Norm with CMS said to, said to Ainley and Aid, can we come up with some sort of a, some scheme to help these people? And so we came up with an income generating scheme whereby these men in particular are being employed to build um, water tanks out of local materials uh, that can be built for schools and churches, collecting water, providing water, whereby the villagers come and instead of having to walk for an hour uh, each day collecting water, they're able to come uh, to the church or the church school there where these tanks have been put in and the local people are able to come and find water. Uh, that's, in, uh, that's, in, that's in Master, but so through that, water is provided. Persecuted Christians from Muslim backgrounds are given a livelihood and all of the benefits that flow from uh, water being provided and that coming from the church being a witness in the area. Um, I also received news last week about from Pakistan. You may know that in Pakistan there are many uh, Christians who work in brick kilns, in bonded labour in the brick kilns. They get paid as a family for a thousand bricks. So a whole day's work, they'll get paid three dollars a day. That's it. Uh, and because of COVID-19, the brick kilns haven't been able to be operating. They haven't been able to to uh, earn money for food. Through Anglican Aid, we've been sending and helping our food parcels for these people. But I, but I received word that one benefit that has come out of this time is that these people who normally work dawn till dusk seven days a week have been able to actually um, hear the word of God. We, uh, we there have some chaplains that work amongst the brick kiln people and they've been going home to home sharing the word of God. Last weekend there, were, there was a baptiz were baptism services with 15 uh, people baptised into the Christian faith as a result of this coming out of this um, uh, COVID-19 time. And they also are benef uh, beneficiaries from our waterworks program as we've got uh, water programs amongst the brick kiln wa workers. Uh, one other example in northern Ethiopia, another rural zone, quite uh, um, dry, arid. Uh, this is an area where it's quite tribal until recently, very hostile towards uh, Christianity. Uh, there's a church in the south, the Kalahaywat Church, that has been sending missionaries up into the north, and they've been getting, toward, getting together the tribal leaders and saying, how can we help you, what do you need help with? And they've said to these, uh, they've said, well, we need water. Uh, we know that there's water up in, the, in those hills. There's a spring up there, but we don't know how, we can't get it down here uh, to where the villages are. So with Anglican Aid, through our waterworks program, we were able to run a pipeline uh, down to the villages. And what has happened has just been quite extraordinary. Uh, the water, over the last couple of years, we've done this, and the waterborne diseases have gone down 95%. Uh, girls, instead of spending an hour or more a day finding water from, from ponds and, and um, having to dig for water, are now able to go to school. So literacy rates are improving, school attendance is improving, uh, health is improving. And off the back of this, um, the community has come together, they've got a new attitude towards the Christian church who have helped them through providing water. And uh, this church has planted church, uh, six churches in the local villages around there as a flowing off this uh, waterworks program. So these are the sort of programs that you are in, involved with through supporting uh, Ang waterworks through Anglican Aid. Real, it really is transforming communities, not just for now, but also bringing the water of eternal life to these people. Around the world, there are still 2.2 billion people who lack access to safe drinking water. Just be thankful every time you turn on the tap. <laughs> uh, and of course, the terrible um, uh, sicknesses that flow from that. So what we are doing is just a trickle. But for those who benefit, it is a stream of life. It's a trickle, but I hope that you see if we have the living water from Jesus welling up inside of us, then this is what Jesus would have us do as Christians. Uh, that Jesus would have us overflow for others to quench their thirst. So Anglican Aid partners with uh, um, Christians to deliver our programs so that uh, those who benefit won't just have water, but will be pointed to the living water of Jesus Christ. 
just like he pointed the woman at the well beyond physical water to spiritual water. Because, of course, it would be a shame to quench someone's physical thirst but leave them spiritually dry. And if you're listening this morning and you haven't come to Jesus to receive that living water, uh, then before you uh, donate to quenching physical thirst for someone, can I urge you to come to Jesus? Come to Jesus, receive that living water. I want to take you to one more place in the Bible, to the beautiful finale which we had read to us from the book of Revelation in chapter 22. Jesus has just said in, 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 in Matthew 25 that those who come to him will have living water, his sheep, they will share that water, they will enter his kingdom. What is his kingdom going to be like? We see a little picture of that in uh, Revelation chapter 22. Will it be anything like the paradise of Eden with the river flowing through it? Well, Revelation chapter 22 verse 1, the angel showed me a river that was crystal clear and its waters gave life. Now, the river came from the throne of God uh, where the lamb was seated. Then it flowed down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river are trees that grow a different kind of fruit every month of the year. The fruit gives life and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. So it's an amazing picture. No more fighting over water, no more arid wastelands, no more thirst. And if you know uh, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel chapter 47, on which this passage is based, the river keeps flowing. It brings life to everywhere and everything. Eden is enlarged and restored. God and the Lamb are on the throne. Satan is banished to the lake of fire. God is ruling in this new creation. The curse has been removed, verse 3, through the Lamb that was slain and God's people are secure forever. This is the new creation. This is the promise where we're heading. And water is at the heart of this vision. Life-giving water. Crystal clear river. Life. Abundance. And the abundance is emphasized in these fruit trees producing fruit every month or perhaps 12 uh, crops of fruit or 12 varieties of fruit. It's a symbol of life just as Jesus himself said, whoever believes in me will never thirst. Never, not in this life, not in the life to come. Whoever is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. So we see here the trees produce the fruit and their leaves have healed the nations. We see turmoil, turmoil across the world today. Who will heal the nations? Is it going to be Donald Trump? Is it going to be the president of China? It's going to be Jesus. And this gospel is the gospel which needs to be preached across the whole world so that all may know that it is Jesus and that all may turn to him for the stream of living water. This is our hope. This is our future. If you haven't yet come to Jesus, come. And if you have come to Jesus, the fountain of life, he has put a fountain in your soul. So will you let it bubble out? Will you let it flow? As we wait for Christ's return, will you spread the water of life, both the physical water through, uh, through the water pump and spiritual water through the message of Jesus Christ? Uh, if you're interested in supporting this program, I'd love you to go to uh, waterworks.org.au. You can visit there or on through the church website, I believe, as well. Thank you to this church for all the support that you have so far given to this program, uh, to letting the water of life flow. I'd like to tell you about, uh, I'll just mention as I finish, an another church, Leppington. Uh, you may know that through the uh, offertories from each Anglican church across the Sydney Diocese, we contribute a little 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 um, levy towards uh, buying new church new uh, land for new churches uh, particularly out west out at leppington near uh, where badgeries creek airport is going to be uh, the anglican church through our contributions managed to buy some land and is starting to build a church uh, a few weeks ago there was an appeal out there f um, for um, for the uh, people in the in their brick kilns and, uh, and, and through water there. And this is a church which is just starting up, a church uh, which they have their own building program there. 
And they had an appeal on Sunday, and amazingly, they raised $20,000 after through, through one week of giving. Not a large church, not a particularly wealthy church, but their generosity overflowed. I just want to give that to you as an encouragement uh, about the generosity which is welling up and causing blessing to many. So thank you, uh, St. Nicholas Kuji, for your support of Waterworks. And may you know this living water flowing through your heart that it may flow out to others as well. Maybe, will you join me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sending Jesus and for sending uh, your Holy Spirit to be a fountain of living water welling up in our hearts. And I pray uh, that this will well up in the way that it overflows to many, that many more way, may know the water of life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for tremendously encouraging words, encouraging to hear what is happening uh, through Anglican aid among people who uh, desperately need clean water and also encouraging to hear what happened out at Leppington there. Now, uh, it's a Nix, you'll know that I'm a bit of a competitive guy and uh, when I hear something like uh, church at Leppington, southwest of Sydney, has been able to raise $20,000 in a week for a water bore, and when I hear that fantastically powerful message that Tim has just given about the, uh, the, the power of su uh, supplying life-giving water to communities that don't have any, I think that at St Nick's Coogee, we need to have a particular effort to raise money for a project, Waterworks project, Anglican Aid, um, and here's the deal. I'm going to kick it off with a family donation of $500, and I think that I'm in, I think, I am now inviting you, whoever is listening to this video, so Nick's members, other members, to make a prayerful, heartfelt and generous donation to Anglican Aid, so specifically for their waterworks projects. And uh, if it is so that the generous people, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ in Leppington, are able to raise $20,000, then I am confident that the generous people here at Coogee will be able to raise an amount which will be able to get water to people who desperately need it. So here's what you can do. You can go directly to the link which is on our community news and that will take you to the donation page of Angli Anglican Aid uh, Waterworks or you can donate to uh, St Nick's church account as, uh, through a direct credit but make it clear it is for Waterworks. Make your donation marked clearly Waterworks and then we will uh, make sure that that money gets to Anglican Aid. There you go, St. Nick's. We've done this before on similar sorts of occasions. Let's do it again and send the uh, hand of love and compassion of Jesus Christ across the waters to supply life-giving water to people who desperately need it.